Okay, I think we're live. This is Matt Carty, MEP, live from Strasbourg. This isn't the RTE news, as you've probably gathered. This is a new idea we've had to try and interact with people via social media. In the European Parliament, it can be very difficult, obviously, to get our message across. So we try different ways all the time. In plenary, by and large, even on the most important debates, MEPs get about a minute to speak. Um, we try, as a Sinn Féin delegation, to get over that by using our video reports that you'll sometimes see. Obviously, um, we do all sorts of interactive um, events. Um, big part of the problem that we engage with is that there is very little media coverage of an awful lot of the things that happen over here, even despite the fact that a large amount of those things actually relate very heavily to Ireland and will have an impact on people's lives. Unfortunately, the media, if they do cover it at home, a lot of the time it's very slanted co coverage, sometimes even sensationalist. Um, one of the things, obviously, that we do at home is organise public meetings, and the next one of the public meetings that I'll be hosting will be in Clonus in County Monaghan on Wednesday, the 18th of October. So if you can come along, please do. We're a team of Sinn Féin MEPs. There's four of us. So there's myself, Lynn Boyle, who represents Dublin, Martina Anderson, who represents the six counties, and Leon Reda, who represents the South constituency. And we work alongside here in the European Parliament um, an awful lot of people. We have a great team of Sinn Féin staff, we have a great team of GUI NGL staff, but we also work with people from other po political groups. And the idea of this Facebook Live um, idea, um, as I say, it's a new idea, but after tonight it might be an old idea if we don't actually um, get the type of engagement that we're hoping for. But the idea is that it'll be an informal conversation, a bit of a chat, um, a bit of a discussion. And especially what we want is to try and introduce you to people that you might not otherwise um, hear from, but to have very important um, views. So it might become a regular occurrence. I have it in my head that if we can get a thousand views um, for this event, then we'll come back, back, back to it. So as I say, we're in Strasbourg. It's known as the Travelling Circus. It's the occasion where once a month the entire European Parliament upsticks and leaves from Brussels and at about a cost of 170 million euro a year we come um, to Strasbourg. And this week was a fairly hectic week, I think, for all MEPs, for myself. There was a debate last night on Ryanair where we took the opportunity to get stuck into Michael O'Leary and the way that he's treated his workers and staff over many years and now um, has carried um, that tradition on to how he's treating his um, con consu consumers. We also had a debate today on the fiscal compact and bizarrely, um, I'm sure a lot of people in Ireland will agree, the European Union is actually moving towards incorporating the fiscal compact into the treaties, in other words, enshrining um, austerity um, for time, um, all time to come. Um, so um, I just want to mention the fact that we have a big launch on the future of the Eurozone um, and on the f fiscal compact. Um, Emma Clancy, who works with us in the Sinn Féin team and the GUI NGL Economic and Monetary Affairs, um, development team specifically um, is working on um, a paper that we're hoping to launch that day and um, we're very pleased to announce that the filmmaker and author um, Thomas Renzi is going to be attending that event which will be in the Dublin European Parliament offices on Friday um, October the 27th. So as well as those issues, there was lots of other issues that our other colleague MEPs will be dealing with. We'll be posting videos and um, messages in relation to some of that work over the next couple of um, days. But undoubtedly, two big issues um, dominated <coughs> the European Parliament this week in Strasbourg. And of course, the first one was Catalonia. And the second one, um, an ongoing issue, and will be ongoing for some time, is the issue of Brexit. So listen, I have a couple of guests here that we're going to have a bit of a conversation with. So our first guest is Elizabeth Nebrada. I think I've pronounced that, that right. And yeah. Elizabeth was um, recommended to us to join this by uh, Jordi Sale, who is um, one of the best MEPs in the European um, um, Parliament. But um, Elizabeth herself is a lawyer. She's a master in international relations. She currently works as an advisor for the Greens EFA um, group here in the European Parliament and covers the Libe and AFET um, committees, which we'll talk about. So I'm also told she was number four on the European Parliament list for her party, Escura. Do I pronounce that right? Yeah. Um, for the European um, elections. Also, she has for five years been the national secretary for international relations for the, the party. So you're a big hitter. Um, <laughs> how many MEPs were elected? 
Two. Two, so okay, so you need to get up Almost the list. Over, so yeah, I need to talk to Jordi and the yeah, guys. Yeah, we yeah. need to make sure that um, you're um, uh, that, that you're in the chamber with, with us, yeah. apart from just the person who does all the, the, the work. Also is with us is Brian Carty, who's um, the GUI NGL staff coordinator on Brexit. So basically the busiest person um, <laughs> um, among our team at the moment. He's been a long standing member of the Sinn Féin team here in Brussels. He's also, unfortunately, a dub. Um, we try to um, um, forgive him that um, from time to time. Um, but Brian is also, he's about as technologically aware as I am, but he's going to try and keep an eye on any comments or um, questions that come in. So if you have any questions, and they can be on anything, um, it's not to say that we'll answer them, but you, if you have any views or, or, or comments. So the interesting thing this week, of course, and the debate that I think captured the public imagination was the whole issue of Catalonia. Um, bizarrely, it appeared on Monday that there might not even be a debate in the European Parliament because it wasn't. we weren't sure if the larger groups yeah. were going to um, support that. I should say and commend from Sinn Féin, Martin Anderson and Lynn Boylan, also Ona Bryn um, TD in Dublin and Senator Trevor O'Claherty who actually travelled to Catalonia were there for the, the weekend. But Elizabeth, it struck me that some of the questions we've actually been getting, and especially in Ireland, where there's a natural empathy and understanding of indigenous peoples seeking their independence. But some of them quietly asked me, why is Catalonia a country? <laughs> Can you explain why, why is it different than other regions, for example? Uh, well, to be uh, strictly speaking, we are not a country yet. We are fighting for becoming one, but we are a nation. And for me, that it's even, I mean, it's easier to explain. Um, nation is when a group of people recognize themselves as equals or that they have a certain common issues that uh, help them define as being from the same group. We not only have a common history in Catalonia, but we have a language, a culture. And uh, what's even more important is that we have this stubbornness, this stubborn willingness to be a nation. And we've been since the beginning of uh, the, I would say it was uh, like the 10th, 11th century. I mean, we've been for, for, for many, many centuries, even before there was such a conception of a Spanish nation or a Spanish state. So we've been a nation for, for many, many centuries. And uh, what we haven't been yet is a, is a state, a country, and that's what we are striving for now. So why now, though? Why was the referendum last Sunday as opposed to uh, some other time? Well, because, I mean, you need to know, well, it, it's important to know where we come from and what has happened during the last few years. I mean, this is not something that popped up like, OK, now we want to hold a referendum on independence because we just woke up and we decided that we want to do that. I mean, uh, to understand why we reached this point in Catalonia, you need to go back until, I don't know, 2006, for instance, when uh, in Catalonia we demanded a new statute of autonomy. And uh, the President Zapatero, uh, at the time the Spanish president, prime minister, um, said um, we will approve, or we will accept the referendum that comes out of the Catalan parliament. And that, that's the, the statute of autonomy that we will accept. So the parliament, the Catalan parliament, uh, approved that uh, statute of autonomy. Among other things, it uh, contained in the preamble, it was not even in the articulate, that said that very frankly, and it goes back to what I said before, that Catalonia was a nation. Uh, and other things about competences and uh, money distribution and everything. So uh, once the Statute of Autonomy went to Madrid, to the Spanish parliament, it was cut off in many parts. Um, one of the parts was that Catalonia being a nation could not be uh, in the main text, but only at the beginning and some other changes. But even that happened. The, the Parliament uh, of Catalonia uh, received back the, the Statute of, of Autonomy and there was a referendum. Uh, and the people of Catalonia massively accepted that. Uh, what happened was that uh, after a while, the PP, who was not in, uh, in the government at that time, uh, decided to take some um, articles of the Statute of Autonomy, including the definition of Catalonia as a nation, to the Constitutional Court, saying that there were some aspects that were unconstitutional. So it was even more cut off. The, um, and that was a, truly a humiliation for us. Okay. And that started a massive, um, I would say, grassroots reaction from several civil organizations 
not only political parties, but the people of Catania felt so humiliated that it was it, it, it escalated at, uh, up until a point that uh, a kind of understanding was trying to be rich with the Spanish state, gaining some more uh, fiscal autonomy. They said no. Uh, we asked for more autonomy. They said no. So we decided that the only way forward was was independence. And uh, I was I tried to be really really brief. Uh, if there are some yeah. qu uh, questions, I will try to explain. Because, well, this is the question that a lot of people have been put because. Quite clearly, the argument from the Spanish state is that the referendum was illegal under the Spanish constitution. And unfortunately, and to their shame, the European Commission are now saying oh, it, 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 the, that the referendum was illegal. And as I was saying to um, Parliament today, you know, nobody can actually say that it's illegal to, uh, for a country to um, decide its, its own future. You know, I, I, I'm, if you were to take that logic, most European countries would still be in the Roman Empire because there was no legal route out of it. We'd still be exactly. under, um, exactly. or the entire island of Ireland would be under um, Brit British rule because there's no legal mechanism to, to leave. So just to clarify for people, is there any legal mechanism for a referendum to be held if we were to go on the, on the basis of the Spanish constitution? For, for, for me and for us, it's not a matter of being legal or illegal, it's a matter of political will. And if there is political will, it can be done. I mean, voting can never be illegal. Um, there are, uh, for instance, there is the case of, uh, I always want to like to mention that in Canada, for instance, the, the constitution in Canada didn't allow for a referendum of uh, independence for the Quebec, for Quebec, I mean. And, uh, but the Supreme Court, what they said was, okay, it's not legal because the constitution doesn't allow for that. But if a majority of people of a territory in Canada, they want to hold a referendum on independence, on whatever, what the, the, the court said was that the central government had the obligation to sit on a table and discuss the terms for that and okay. to make it possible because the law cannot impede people to express, the, or the majority of people to express their, their, their feelings, their will, I mean, law cannot constrict that. I mean, it, it's, it, for me, it's evident. But if you listen to um, what Rahaya is saying, what the Spanish king is saying, a king, you know, a, God help us in, in this, yes, in this way, day and age, yeah. like what's a country still doing yeah. um, with, with a king? But yeah, anyway, yeah, that's yeah. neither here nor there. Ancien regime, um, thing, yeah. But from listening to what they are saying, you know, they're not open to dialogue. They're not open to discussion. No, not so, at all. so what? Where next for the Catalan people? What's the what's the response going to be? Well. Uh, for now, we are really try, uh, well, um, eager to or waiting for a kind of mediation for the, for, from the European Commission. Today, unfortunately, we, we saw during the, the debate here in the Parliament, the European Parliament, that that's not going to be possible or feasible because uh, the European Commission has completely refused to, uh, um, to play this role, which I think it's the role that should be played by... Yeah by this uh, institution. So basically we are counting on some kind of international mediation to, um, you know, we are sitting in the table. We've never left the table, the negotiation table. We're just waiting for the Spanish part to sit as well. And uh, if nobody, I mean, uh, achieves that, uh, achieves that, you know, um, that the Spanish part sits there, we are um, faced to, you know, to uh, go for the unilateral way. Unfortunately, I mean, there's no other option. The, a, a clear majority of the Catalan people said they wanted a referendum. A clear majority of people, notwithstanding the fact that it was almost impossible to hold a referendum, that we had police repression, that they had taken um, ballots, that... Uh, yeah, I want you to talk about what happened on, on Sunday, because it's 2017, and this is yeah. what I think angered so many people. Yeah. In this year, you know, when we're told that we're part of a European Union that is lecturing people all over the world about peace and human rights and democracy, we had a situation where an EU member state sent armed guards out to violently attack people going to, going to vote. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is miraculous that 42% of Catalans, despite that, actually went out to uh, um, ensure that their their voice was was heard um, but from a catalonian perspective like what does what does that mean to people in catalonia that the state that apparently loves them so much would actually go to such lengths as to attack citizens on the street because they have the audacity to want to actually express <coughs> an opinion through a ballot box 
Well, first of all, we never felt that we were loved so much by the Spanish state. That's to, to start with. If we had felt loved by the Spanish state, maybe we would, uh, would have found a kind of accommodation within the state. But that's why we're here. And number two, how we felt? Well, we felt humiliated. We felt that, um, that we had to find a way, no matter uh, how hard the Spanish state was putting things, because it's dignity. It's about dignity. It's about, um, I don't know, it, just the, the deep, deep uh, willingness to go to the ballot boxes, which is not, there's nothing more democratic than that, and express your political desires and uh, the kind of relationship that you want with the Spanish state. And the, we Catalans, we are a, a people that the more that they hit us, the more pri proud that we become and the more determined that we become to, 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 to do what we think is right. And what the majority of the people of Catalonia thought it was right last Sunday was no matter how difficult the Spanish state was putting things, to go and make the referendum possible, to let all people that they were crying because they, are, they were casting their votes, to let uh, young people express themselves because it's their future which is in, uh, at stake right now, to let parents with children and vote for them, for their future and for our present. So it was about dignity as well. Yeah, th um, thanks for that. Brian, are the Spanish giving the Brits a run for their money as the most oppressive well, administration in Europe? Or? Well, well it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? They're, they're certainly, um, well, they, they've always had a fairly oppressive setup in the, in the Spanish state, as far as I can see. And they've got the, you know, the, the sort of British look back to the days of empire, and that's their kind of motivating force. And the sort of Spanish state, it, it, there's still a lot of it that seems that you know Franco. The, Franco is still in there in the apparatus of the state to a large extent. So, so to be honest, it's a tough one as to who you'd prefer to deal with. <laughs> At least what the Brits did, of course, was they agreed something with the Scottish to say, "Look, folks, if you vote to leave, then." Fair enough, we'll respect that. And so there's a willingness there and a flexibility. Yeah, they ran some bit. dirty tricks to and convince them to vote they, a particular oh, way as well. All of that, but at least at the end of the day, you know, you didn't have that reaction. Maybe the British are just a little bit cuter, are they smarter? Uh, probably, more, more conniving. Is there any other words we can think that, of to describe I, them? And I think it's what, you know, what uh, Elizabeth was saying is, is that the Catalans don't feel loved and the Spanish make no pretense of loving the Catalans. The English pretend to love the Scottish. I think there's an element to that, okay. pretending to love. And they're holding a, a bit of our own country as well. Well, there's, yeah, a, there's a fair bit of our own country there, which you, you don't know. We'll come, we'll come on to that in a minute. But just before we move on from Catalonia, I'm just wondering, you know, you've been talking to Martin and others who were over there. Is there anything like that we could be saying tonight to people who might be watching this in Ireland? as to what they could be doing, or in any other EU country outside of um, Spain or Catalonia. What, what can we do, what, other than just shout, tweet, hashtag Catalan referendum or whatever? Well, what, I, what I'd say is, is that, you know, obviously it's not just something that happened on, so on Sunday and we can forget about it. There's a sort of something, it's needed pressure over the next while. And, you know, um, if you feel, you know, if there's a way of just sort of showing the support to the Catalans that, that it's not just people turned up for the referendum, we go home and we forget about it. I think that's one important thing. Uh, keep an eye on the situation. Maybe even sort of, maybe even you need to get to Catalonia, Mass, you know, at some point in the future for some other important step in the process. And that, you know, there's kind of... I never get to the hot countries. <laughs> they, always, they, always, they always send me to the places where there's, but, where there's but, loads of rain. But that would be one of the things I'd say, you know, it's, it's a long-term thing. And then concretely, I mean, there'd, there'd probably be um, there'd probably be uh, a good value in in just you know let's see how we can get pressure on uh, on the elected reps, uh, particularly TDs um, in Ireland, uh, to to get a recognition of the the importance of Catalan uh, independence. Put pressure on the government. I think one of the really depressing. The responses was actually from Leo Varadkar, who's the Irish Taoiseach, who, you know, first of all, managed on Sunday along with an entire government to say nothing. And to me, it was quite clear that they were actually waiting to hear what Jean-Claude and their mates in Brussels said before they um, opened their mouth. And while they rightly have condemned the, um, the Spanish um, police actions, and while they've also 
now agreed, thanks to pressure from Gerry Adams in the Dáil, that they will raise it with um, the Spanish PP, which are their sister parties um, in, gov in government in, in Spain. You know, just, the, just the flippant dismissal of the Catalan's right to independence, uh, coming from a country like our own, um, that has gone through. We might just come back um, to that if we have a little bit of extra time. But I just wanted, before we start talking about Brexit, just mention a couple of other things that we've been dealing with um, here or engaging with. You've probably heard, especially anybody who's involved in the agriculture sector, lots of crocodile tears from Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael representatives in relation to the Mercosur trade agreement, which is the trade agreement between um, South America and the EU. And lots of them are throwing their arms up and shouting about um, how devastating it is that you know, basically the beef and poultry and lots of other agriculture sectors are effectively being um, sold out by Phil Hogan and his mates in the commission. But you know, what I'm asking people to do, read between the spin. We've been highlighting the dangers of these um, EU trade deals, whether it be with CETA, TTIP, the New Zealand deal and the proposed um, Australian deal, and all of them can't be just taken in isolation. They have to be looked at as a collective, very aggressive EU Commission um, trade ag agenda, and they're all bad. And I was very pleased to see Gerry Adams actually using his leader's questions in the Dáil today to actually um, 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 raise, that, raise that issue and put pressure on um, Fianna Gael in particular, but also Fianna Fáil, and we need people to continue doing that. Also, I just want to make a brief reference to the fact that um, the government are being taken to court because they haven't collected a single cent from Apple yet. Now, this is actually nothing to do with the case. As part of the original finding of the commission, the government has to start making arrangements. They haven't made um, an iota of progress on that. And when you consider now that they're going to court, and when, if you go back to the earlier parts of, say, last year, when they were telling us about how dangerous it would be if they were taken to court on water charges, you know, the difference being water charges were charges that were being imposed on ordinary people. Apple tax um, is a charge being put on one of the wealthiest corporations in the world. They need to face up. They need to start throwing down um, the, the money. And it's my v belief that when the case is eventually held, when all the cases are eventually held, the Irish government's actually going to be handed over. They're going to lose their case and they're actually going to be given 13 billion euro in return. So rather than spending millions of euro between now and then actually trying to um, just prolong it and fight you know, your know, wasted um, battles, we should actually start investing that 13 billion euro. I want to m move on to Brexit because there was some really important progress um, this week. Um, the European Parliament, in my view, effectively endorsed our calls for special status by um, essentially saying that the North needs to stay in the customs union and the single market. And Bertine Anderson, who obviously is our lead person on, um, uh, um, on Brexit, she represents the constituency that voted to remain, um, a part of Ireland that's actually been um, threatened with being dragged out of the e EU. Um, but Brian, I thought, and the reason I asked you to come along, because I thought it would be useful if you'd give a sense of, you know, what goes in. You, you're, you are behind the scenes, the only Irish person who is actually in the room when the doors are closed, when people are going through. Give us some insight in terms of what exactly happens in order to come to that resolution, and especially, you know, when the elements relating to Ireland were actually so strong. Well, um... I suppose the elements relating to Ireland, it's just, it are so strong. It's because there's an objective real, reality of a land border between the EU, you, you know, what, what potentially becomes an external border of the EU, um, uh, you know, in the middle, in the middle of Ireland. So, you know, that has to be dealt with and sorted out, which is, which is why, you know, yeah, Ireland is there, it's ever present and it's, it's been made one of the, three priority issues for the whole Brexit negotiations, for the first phase of the Brexit negotiations. One of the issues that we need serious progress on before we can actually go along, go on to discuss what will be the future relationship between Britain and the EU. Um, so, I mean, how I mean, how it works is effectively in, in, in April there was a resolution of the European Parliament after the British government triggered Article 50. There was a resolution in the European Parliament very quickly afterwards. Um, Five political groups broadly supported that resolution, um, and those five political groups, uh, um, who sort of shown a, a sort of a, a certain common understanding about the challenge that Brexit represents and the importance of um, uh, you know a, a, a united European response to it, 
um, are working together in a Brexit steering group, so-called, which has been put in place by the uh, by the by the well by the presidents of the political groups of the Conference of Presidents, so-called. So that Brexit steering group is the place where where you know those five groups get together, look at all aspects of Brexit, advise the European, make recommendations to the European Commission, advise the European Council, and occasionally adopt resolutions uh, in relation to uh, in relation to Brexit. Um, so you know you have the sort of uh, the liberal group, you have the social democrat group, you have the Christian democrat group, and you have the green EFA group, and then you have ourselves in the GUI NGL left group. Um, so, I mean, so is it hard in that circumstance then to get um, those groups to agree on language that's stronger than, say, the council language, which is the government's mm. um, p position? Considering, like, the biggest group obviously is DPP, so that's Fine Gael's gr um, group. You know, is there not a fear, perhaps, that you know that the parliament, um, which has clearly been influenced <coughs> to some degree by um, Sinn Fein? Has a stronger position than the council, which was where Fine Gael, you know. So, is there a fear the DPP would try and backtrack on some of the more progressive elements relating to Ireland? Well, I mean, I mean, let's say that I don't think when you get that 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 sort of breadth of political groups sitting in the room, I don't think you're, you're ever going to get a, a, a Sinn Féin policy. But I think as well that that the people in the steering group, they're sort of. Um, uh, politically wise enough to, to sort of realise what's going on, what the reality is on the ground, the problem that's caused by, you know, talking about Ireland now in particular, the problem that's caused by the border, the 277 crossings of the border that can't be closed and, and whatever. So so there is a willingness to, uh, to, to go further than you might expect them to go to, to say, well, you know, this really, really needs to be addressed. As the European Parliament, we don't actually have to be as cautious as the Council and can go a little bit further. So you're getting, you're getting stuff there, like for example, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and all its parts is really important. Yeah. Part. Absolutely, and then that influenced the Council to go a little bit further as well. Um, so you're getting now very clear recognition that whatever happens to to Britain, which should stay in the in the single market and the customs union. Whatever happens there, though, the North needs to remain in the single market and the customs union. So effectively, that there's a different treatment, a unique solution, a special status for the North uh, in some way. And uh, there's a... Well, I think what the, what the, the message I want to, to, to know is, as somebody who's obviously completely neutral, can we say with certainty that Sinn Féin, the fact that we have four M MEPs, the fact that we have Martina being the only voice of the North who's actually arguing for the decision of the people of the North to be respected, are making that, are, are influencing the, these resolutions in the, in, in, the, in, in the manner in which it needs to be in order for the entire island to be protected in the post-Brexit scenario? Uh, I I think with absolute certainty. You're saying that as a as an absolute neutral as, <laughs> as well. As an absolute neutral. Yes. With absolute certainty, without the four MEPs and the, and the respect that that the four of you have built up across the board with different political groups dealing with different issues, um, uh, that has had an impact. You know, it's recognised very clearly within this institution that when it comes to Ireland, there are two serious political forces coming from Ireland, and that's Fine Gael and it's Sinn Féin. And that is recognised, and so it gives us a, a way, it gives us an influence which is quite important in, in all of this. At the end of the day, though, in terms of, because the Parliament resolutions, you know, I have a fear that whenever a final settlement is agreed, you know, a lot of the European leaders will consider, well, the you know, the governments will put pressure on their respective parties here in Parliament um, and therefore the Parliament's view might not necessarily hold as much weight as we would like. You know, are we really in a good position when we're dependent on people like Eva Hostoff to, um, to protect us or is, is it a case that on this, on this issue he has been convinced of the need for the entire island to be treated as a special case? I, I think I think there is a conviction there more and more an understanding within the European Parliament, including Guy Verhofstadt of yeah, look, we need to have you know, we can't put a border in the, an external border of the EU in the middle of Ireland. It has to remain no no hardening of it. Uh, it can, you know, you can't conceive of custom post anything like that. And so that if that means 
yes, a special status, although we can't really call it a special status because the, the words don't really work. So unique solution, special arrangements, something like I'm that. I'm still going to call it a special status. Well, you're entitled to. But <laughs> well, that's what we. Yeah, that, that, that's what we, Well, <laughs> but in, that's the reality of it. It needs the north needs to be treated and differently, and I think there's a clear understanding of that across the board. Increasingly, you know, it's seen that you know it's not just those sort of Sinn Fein people with their own political agenda, but this is a reality of how how we deal with the fact that Britain is, is leaving the EU. What I would say as well is that, look, I mean, the European Parliament has a veto on the whole thing, um, uh, uh, on any agreement at the end of the day. Uh, whether it should use that if you have an agreement that's signed up to by all of the member states on pressure being brought to bear or not, I'm not entirely sure. But there is a veto there, which means throughout the whole process, um, Michel Barnier, who's the EU negotiator, he has to engage with the European Parliament. He was in the plenary session yesterday, that's fine. He meets, he meets with the steering group uh, on Brexit on an almost weekly basis. So there's a chance there okay. to sort of to discuss and to sort of to help shape a little bit the, 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 the process. I suppose it should be said that a lot of people here just looking objectively see the simplest solution to dealing with all the issues that arise from Brexit from Ireland is actually Irish unity. So we're trying to build um, support for that. You have a look there at any comments that are coming through uh, before I just go back to Elizabeth. Um, so I know you work on Libe and um, AFET, isn't it? Um, yeah. AFET is the... Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs and um, Libe is obviously civil liberties. So obviously Brexit's going to come into those two. As a Catalan... Um, re representative among the, the staff. Have you more important things to be worried about considering what's happening or are you keeping an, an eye on the Brexit negotiations? Me, myself, I, I'm not following um, uh, the Brexit uh, issues because uh, we are like different advisors and each yeah. follows uh, its thing. But, uh, well, yeah, of course, that uh, Brexit is an important item on, on the table. It's been maybe one of the three major uh, questions that have shaken up the European Union in the last few years. First being, I don't know, the economic and financial crisis, the refugee crisis, and then the Brexit. So, yeah, it's an important uh, issue. Although I don't have the insight that Brian has. He knows a lot about it, and uh, it's great to listen he's to him. Real, he's a real know-it-all. It's great to listen to him because yeah. I'm learning so much now. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know if you share the concerns that I'd have, for example, that notwithstanding you know, the positive moves that towards Ireland and other areas that um, have happened in terms of the Brexit negotiations specifically, but the fact that there's an awful lot of people in this parliament and the other European institutions who are actually using Brexit as an opportunity to steam ahead with some of the more really regressive elements of EU policy, particularly around an EU common defence or army, um, uh, effectively, you know, some of the, the, the other measures, you know, so in, in effect, um, a lot of people see getting rid of the Brits as being an opportunity to steam ahead with, you know, less democratic control, more centralism at, a, at an EU level. Um, and I know lots of people within the Greens EFA group have been really strong at highlighting those points. Yeah, 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 definitely. And it's not only Brexit. I think that we are living now in a moment where, well, you know, we have a majority from the right side. And it's not only Brexit, but now they are taking the opportunity also related with what I said before with the refugee crisis to talk about security, with terrorism, with uh, the breaching of liberties, and um, it's 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 terrible. We are we are stepping back a few oh. steps. I have to say, I was actually wondering whether we would have um, um, enough time to or be able to fill the, the time. I'm now being told by Matthias, who's um, our very able and um, professional uh, um, um, producer um, here that we need to wrap up in the next um, two minutes. Brian, any really good questions coming in there? And yes. we might get back in terms of actually responding by writing if we, if we need to. But well, I mean, there's a few, few interesting things there just about the question or the question of what can be done is there's a suggestion which might be, I don't know, maybe Elizabeth has a view on it, boycott Spanish goods and holidays. But no, that no. came that came in just after there was talk of you going there, Matt. So yeah. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's there was a question uh, from Mark as well about uh, well, there's a proposed reaction force of some sort of the EU, and would Ireland participate in that given EU neutrality? I don't think there's talk at this stage though of any 
you know, direct intervention from the EU. Uh, oh, no, I far from it. Far, I mean, far, yeah, far yeah, from I mean, yeah. so, no, no. so I don't think that's a thing. And obviously, you know, from our point of view, neutrality. I'm really, I'm really sorry. And I'm really sorry yeah. to those people who um, who commented. Um, Brian just rambled on a bit longer than I, uh, I expected. But listen, I hope you uh, um, enjoyed it. As I mentioned earlier on, this well, isn't and wasn't the RTE news. And there probably the reason you knew that was because there was two shinners on it when um, most of the time we won't even have one this week. Pierce Doherty launched um, Sinn Féin's alternative budget, which is a really important document. We're probably one of the few opposition parties in the world that on an annual basis produces causes alternative to basically show the government that there's a better, fair way of doing business. And RTE last night on their main even news didn't even cover it. And on prime time last night, they actually held a debate between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael on the housing crisis of all things. The, two, the one issue that both parties can claim equal, equal um, um, credit it for. It's not good enough. So listen, thanks very much for um, tuning in. We're going to check in tomorrow. If we've had over a thousand views over the next 24 hours, we might come and do this again. But thank you, um, thank you. sincerely to Elizabeth. Thanks for being part of it's this experiment. And Brian, who's always willing to be my guinea pig, thank you for coming along also. So listen, Slangafall. Thank you, Matthias.